Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to the service here at Ephesus. We appreciate everyone being here, especially those who are visiting with us. We'll start by singing number 619 in the big book, number 619. After we sing this song, Brother Jacob will have our scripture reading. Then after our scripture reading, Brother Joel will lead us in our opening prayer, and then we'll go to our classes. 619. Take time to be holy, speak of with thy Lord, abide in him always, and be on his word. Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 17, reading from New King James. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being our God and for providing for us every day, Father. You bless us so well that we often take our blessings for granted, but we want to give you the glory and the honor for all that you do for us, and we, we sing your praise, Father, for all the wonderful things that you provide for us. Father, even in our opportunity to worship you this morning, we thank you that we can be in your presence here in this building this morning. 
And we pray, Father, that you would help each of us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we may put away from our minds the cares of this world, that we may truly worship you in a way that would be pleasing to you, bring glory to you, and help build each one of us up in the most holy faith. Father, we are mindful of those of our number that are sick and some have lost loved ones. We pray, Father, that your healing hand will be upon the sick and your comfort will be upon those that are struggling with loss of loved ones. And we pray that you'll be with all of us, Father, and help each of us to help bear each other's burdens that we can make life just a little bit easier as we make our way through this, this uh, life on this earth. But most importantly, Father, we pray that you would help us, all of us to look forward to that time that we can come home and live with you in heaven after a while where the, when, where the problems that we now face will no longer be. We'll have an eternity with you. Father, we thank you for this worship this morning. We pray that you'll be with us as we enter our, into our classes. Help each of us, Father, to study your word with open minds and pure hearts that we may learn the message that you provided for us and then help each of us to properly apply it to our lives that we may be better Christians throughout our life. We can do pray for the church here and help, pray that you'll help each of us to grow and develop to become just what you would have us to be. In all things, Father, we pray that your will will be done. For this is our prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Well, first of all, this morning, I'll apologize because I'm the only teacher you have this morning up here. There's so many that are much better out there, but here I am. Uh, Brother Robert and Sister Diane are out of town this week. Uh, this weekend, I think he is preaching in Mississippi, I believe, today. And I'll forewarn you, they're out of town next week, too, so <laughs> it will be me again. Uh, appreciate you being here this morning. We have a good crowd for class. And appreciate those who are joining us online. Also, I'm glad to have you join in our class with us. I believe that Robert uh, completed number 15, I believe, so we're to start on number 16. I wanted to make sure of that. That's what I had marked. Number 16 in this lesson as we continue in James chapter 5. Uh, speaking of, of a prayer, and number 16 is the what? Effective Fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. I looked at these three words and then I, start, I thought, I want to define those three words. I want, to, I want to know what each one of them meant. So the definition of prayer I found 
uh, this one, a solemn request for help or the expression of thanks addressed to God, an earnest hope or wish. It's a lot said in that sentence. A solemn request for help or the expression of thanks addressed to God. Earnest hope or wish. And we always bring those things to God. Or we should. I hope you do. I know I do. The, who else can we take them to? We can dwell on them ourselves. But we, we just need God's help with those things. Request to God for help maybe for forgiveness. I think that's where I go most of the time. I, what I go most times for is forgiveness. Father, forgive me for the things I might have said or done that was wrong. And help, and, uh, and for his help, we, uh, we go, that we, not, we have the strength not to do that again. We address God to give thanks for blessings and things that God has provided for us because how many things does he provide for us? Everything. Everything. We're nothing without God. But James speaks here of more than just a casual prayer or just a quick prayer to God, but he speaks of what kind of prayer? Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Effective prayer. What is effective prayer? Results. It has results. And when, we, and when we ask God, does God always answer our prayer right then? No. We have to learn to wait. And as Robert has said before, and I'm sure that all of us has thought it, we want it to happen right now. We want it, I think Robert usually puts it, we want it microwave style when we're standing there for the 30 seconds for your coffee to heat up and it seems like forever. But we want it to happen right now. Fervent prayer. <laughs> Divine, fervent, having or displaying a passionate intensity in our prayer. Fervent means to have uh, intense or strong feelings, very serious. Intense is defined also as hot, burning, flowing. And we don't just say, God, you know, I just need to talk to you. About, we need to talk to him effectively, fervently, with passion, passionately, and with feeling. Don't let our love and care come into your thoughts. It, kind of right. And we're, and don't let our worldly cares come into, into being, into our minds. Keep that out. Because as, as Brother Vernon said, all of a sudden we're off on another track. Pray where it's quiet. We don't have to. We can pray anywhere. God hears our prayer anywhere. James is, is making also the point that praying with passion and intensity is an important part of seeing our prayers answered. We have to do that with feeling. God needs to know that we care and that we know that he cares and that he knows what we need so that he can, he can answer our prayers. And, uh, and fervent is not the only one, only thing here. 
uh, we pray earnestly. Earnestly. What does that mean? With feeling. We know, we, we ask God for what we want, what we, what we need for forgiveness. Thanks for, the, for, for all he's done for us. And then it's the prayers of what? Of whom? A righteous man. Prayers of a righteous man that are effective. What is the difference in those prayers? Prayers of a righteous man, prayers of someone else. I'm sorry. The opposite of someone who doesn't care, who doesn't try, who doesn't live the way they should. James urges believers to confess their sins to each other, doesn't he? he, he in, in, the, uh, in the question before in number 15, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You can be whole. You can be righteous. So being open about our weaknesses here, as he says, as he speaks in number fifteen, as we confess those weaknesses and sins with one another and with God, this has an effect on our prayer life. We can speak more effectively more straightforward, more fervently, more with all, all feelings. It helps. It benefits if we are living right, that we are righteous people. I heard a man say one time, he said, do you, how long do you wait each day before you pray? And he said, I learned uh, years before in his life, he said, I usually wait till I put my feet on the floor in the morning before I pray. That is, he said, I have made that my first prayer time. What do I pray for? whatever's on my heart. But he said, I do one thing. I always make it to pray for someone. He said, I always, it may be someone in my family that needs my prayer. It may be someone in my church family that needs my prayer. It may be someone that I know that is lost that needs my prayer, but I pray for someone, not just for me, but I pray for someone. And I thought that was, it was, it's such a nice thought. He said, then what do you do? You wait for breakfast? Prayer before breakfast? It's good. Please don't tell me that you wait till lunch for the next one. He said, you know, we've, we've read about it in the Bible, they prayed five times. Do you think that's a lot? Do you think five times is a lot? And then in the afternoon, he said, I, I usually have prayer time. That's, that's my Bible time. He was a retired person. He said, that's my Bible time, my prayer time. But he said, and then at dinner, prayer. 
But he said, those are not the only times. He said, I may not even slow down what I'm doing, but I think of something and I pray. So I, I thought that it, it, it sounded, it sounded probably better than I've done a lot of times. But the first prayer was when he put his feet on the floor in the morning. It helps us. It makes us feel better. I, all right, I know it does me. That I remember to pray for someone or something that is going on, not necessarily in my life, but in somebody else's life, that they need God's help with, and it benefits. This is the way, as the Bible verse says, this is a way that we can avail ourselves. We can take advantage of every opportunity or availability to pray. Number 18, then Elijah prayed again and it, what? What had he prayed for before? That it would not rain. And how long did it not rain? Did how, how long did God hold the rain back from them? Three and a half years. It's a long dry spell. And you know that they had, they had needed rain before that. You know that they had. Donnie, yes, sir. Have you ever wondered what happened around here if it didn't rain for three and a half years? I did. I have. I've thought about that and thought about it again as I was studying this lesson. Right, right. Probably would. And how did people survive for drink, just drinking water? Their crops failed, you know. Their fruit trees and any kind of crop that they were, anything they were growing. Didn't, it is, it's hard for us to imagine. It is. But then Elijah prayed again, and it rained. What kind of prayer do you think Elijah prayed? Effective, fervent prayer. Somebody else said something. For it to rain. And you know, after that time, as we've talked, these people were suffering. They were suffering, you know. And he prayed, and it rained. An effective, fervent prayer. <coughs> this is the, he is the perfect example, and I'm sure that's why it's in, James recorded in his, lesson, in his letter, because it was effective, and it was fervent. It was passionate. Here's our prayer. Right. Prayers are answered. It may not, as Brother Joel said, it may not be the way we ask or what we ask for, but it's answered. It may be no. And we've all received those. It wasn't what God wanted for us, so the answer was no. The waiting period is, again, what we kind of get a hang up about. It's because we're waiting. We don't want to wait. We're not a waiting people. We want things and we want them now. So we'll wait three years before we finally sit down and talk for a prayer. You know, right. keep saying, I'll sit down, I'll keep saying, I'm going to do it. It'll take three years and finally say, I've had enough. <laughs> We, we, uh, we don't have to wait three and a half years to pray. We can pray at any time, and God, as Brother Joel said, and God hears our prayer. Psalm 
So do you think that Elijah might have changed his way of praying in three and a half years? Oh, yeah. Just not for rain, because he asked it not to. But then he prayed another effectual, fervent prayer. Do we pray differently, or do we always pray the same? It's, it, we, it, it almost has to be differently, doesn't it? Right. Thanksgiving and praise. Very true. Very true. Our prayer shouldn't always be to ask for something, but to give thanks for what we have received. I learned to pray many years ago. Have I prayed the same for 73 years? No, I haven't. How many times did you go to sleep when you was a little boy or a little girl and now I laid me down to sleep? That was probably, I know it was my first prayer. Learned it very young, very long time ago. But it's, it's uh, and our children, it was always so sweet to hear them at night say their, say their little prayer. It was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear that. Uh, so, yes, I, I have changed. As I've grown, I have become aware of many more things to pray about. And I know that you have too. Uh, this causes me to pray, uh, as I'm sure you have. I remember as a young man, again, several years ago, but I learned to pray that I would find someone to spend my life with. And I didn't know how to describe the person I needed, I wanted. But I knew God would know what I needed. And he sent me. And 51 years later, as of next week, God blessed me with a helpmate. And we've had a, a, a good life together. And 50 years, 50 years ago, don't tell Heather I said that, almost 50, we were blessed with our first child. You really learn to pray harder and harder because you, I never had this little, you know, God gave us this little being and placed her in our arms and we were just so happy and so proud and We've got to raise this baby, you know. We've got more responsibility. As parents, wow, well, did I pray. I prayed hard. And almost 47 years ago, you don't have to mention that to Carrie either, uh, we became parents again. Prayer after prayer through the years for help, for guidance, for forgiveness when we did wrong. I remember the question, have I taught them well? Have I taught them enough? Have we taught them enough? But they do, we do, Brother Vernon said it felt like it was a graduation day when they married and moved away. Wow, was we lost when they, <laughs> that happened. Uh, both, both nights after our girls got married, we didn't sleep a wink, cried all night. Just as hard with the second one as the first one. Our, our youngest got married first and back. But 
through the years, we learn, we mature. We learn more how to pray, what to pray for, how to pray for it. We learn. Two years ago, our son-in-law, Brian, became ill. And I prayed and continued to pray. Still pray for him today, as I know many of you have and do. And we appreciate that. I thought one day, I've learned so much about how to truly pray through this illness with Brian. But through, uh, we prayed for him when he was sick. We prayed for him after they found out what was wrong. We prayed for him through a, through a transplant. And then we pray, still pray for him today as he recovers. And I have something to tell you. Brian is back working again. He, has, he is the bailiff for uh, a court in Gunnersville, and he began last week with his job. Of course, the whole week he worked so hard, he worked an hour and a half. That was the only court session they had. But the good thing about that is, not only did he not have to work very long, but he got paid for a whole week. I'm a little envious of that, but anyway. But we are so thankful and thankful to you all for your prayers and thankful to God for answering our prayer, prayers as he did. And number 19, if anyone wanders from the truth and someone turns him back or, conver or converts him, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. If anyone wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, converts him, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Why do you think the author put the word hide in parentheses in that, in that uh, sentence? When you cover it up, and who covers it up? God no longer sees it. He no, he no longer has it. It's no longer there. It's gone. It's hidden. It's covered. Covered by the blood of Jesus. No greater covering will there ever be. Anyone who believes that you cannot be lost does not take heed to James 5.20, do they? Does not take heed. They may have never read it, but they, they certainly do not take heed of it. Verse 20, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. They have saved a soul from torment. So if they have, if they, if believers do not believe that or if people do not, that do not believe that, and there are many, there are many. I always remember this lady that I work with. She was leaving work early one day and I asked her, I said, what are you leaving work for? And well, we've been friends for years. And she said, I'm going to the Derby. Going to the Derby. I said, let me ask you something. You don't bet on the horses, do you? She said, oh, yeah. Yeah. I saved up my money to bet on the horses. <laughs> I said, you don't do that. I said, 
name was Shirley. I said, Shirley, you're a Christian woman. I know you are. I've been around you for years. And you're one of the most, I don't know, she was just always so caring. And so, and always speaking of the Lord. And she said, Don, don't you know if the Lord leads you to it, he'll lead you through it. And I said, well, but still, and we went on with her conversation. I couldn't believe she said that. I couldn't, but she, she thought it was okay. In her belief, she thought it was all right. Gambling was okay. I still, still see her today, still care about her, still think the world of her. But I just, it, it kind of floored me that she had that belief that it was okay for her to do whatever she wanted to because she was saved. And of course, now I've, I'd never been taught that. So, you know, that, that's another thing. You know, we, have to, we, we have to search for the truth. James is saying here that if a brother turns away from the truth and someone goes out and <coughs> brings him back, he has saved him from death, saved him from being lost. Now, do we do this? We have to try. How do we save this brother or sister from being lost forever. How do we approach someone like that? That's a great, that's a, it's a lot of difference in the ways we can approach them. We should approach them with gentleness, with kindness, not with ridicule and, you know, and all that. If we do that, if we approach them with harshness, harsh words and mean words, and uh, you know those words are they're a turnoff. I worked with another man, good Christian man, knew the Bible, but if he asked someone, and this is an example, he would ask them, "Where do you go to church?" That would be his his way of starting to talk to them. And if they told him something he didn't want to hear, his answer was, you know you're going to hell, don't you? Do you think those people ever heard another word? Most of them turned away before something, some other words were said. But you can't approach people with, that, with harshness like that, with harsh words, with demeaning words. And it's got to be gentle. You, you, you go into it with gentleness. And that was my next point. Thank you, Brother Dwight. You approach them with gentleness and love. Let them know that you are concerned about their soul, about the way they're living. You got one mouth, two ears. <laughs> right. One mouth, two ears. Listen closely to what they have to say before you jump on them, because it's going to be over when you do. To approach in this matter, it's just, it's no good. It's not going to, probably not going to lead to further talk or a further meeting or a further study or anything like that that you're hoping for. You do not want to turn them away right off the bat. And this gentleman that, I, that I'm speaking of did that so many times, so many times. And how are we to act if we are the one that is approached and told that we're doing wrong? How do we, what would be the first thing that we think of? We're going to be defensive, aren't we? Well, I don't appreciate that. But then we are, if we stop and we think about it, and if, and if it's done with love and with, uh, uh, you know, without harshness, We'll take a moment to think about it. And when we think about it and we decide if we were wrong or if we weren't wrong, then we can 
reciprocate with love and, and with uh, kindness. And we can talk about it. We can study about it. And many times we find out, I was wrong. I was wrong. These people that do that love you, love you and are sincerely concerned about your soul. We are to receive them with love just the way that they are to approach us with love and with kindness. We have to humble ourselves sometimes. And as the old song goes, it's hard to be humble. And if we humble ourselves, we'll most likely be thankful that this person cared enough about us to come to us and help us, bring us back. In studying this lesson, I heard a lesson taught. I listened to a lesson that was being taught and the speaker ended, up, ended James' letter by saying that James added four postscripts, as we do to a note sometime or to a letter that we may be writing. I don't guess we use that as much anymore since we write our letters with our thumb. But I can't do any more because my thumb shakes and I have to <laughs> do this. But he, uh, the speaker said he added four postscripts or four P.S.'s to his letter. Four P's is what he called them. Persevere. The Lord is near. Don't give up. Whatever the low, the hardship, the discouragement, this doesn't give us, uh, doesn't keep us from serving Him and obeying Him. Remember and I love this part of his lesson. He said, remember, the crown of life is for the one who finishes. The one who finishes. For the one who finishes faithfully. The crown doesn't come at the beginning. You get it at the end. Anyone can start... Anyone can start. The finishing is the difficult part. Perseverance. Staying with it. Number two was pure. Pure in heart. Uh, being from uh, within your commitment. Be a yes Christian. Even when it can't. When it. Uh, cost you something. Remember, it cost Jesus his life for us to be Christians, for us to be saved. Number three was pray. Elijah asked for it to stop raining and God answered his prayer. Can God not answer your prayer? He can not answer it right then, can he? But we always get an answer. May not be the again, may not be the one we want. Can he not find you a solution to your problems? Of course. Sometimes I felt like I would have never and probably most times. I've never found a solution on my own. Faith that God can do anything, pray and wait for the Lord. Number four, pause. Be careful. You can, lo you can lose your way. It has happened to others and it can happen to us. Be thankful for the person who has the love and the courage to correct you and bring you back to the Lord. 
I appreciated this brother's lesson, and, and I wanted to share those four points with you. Well, that did pretty good. James is a wonderful book. I, I've just read it over and over, and I, I love to read it. It's one that we need. It's one we can use. It's one that blesses us. It's one that encourages us. It's one that tells us what we need to do. It's just another beautiful book in God's Word. Thank you for your kind attention and your patience with me. And Lord willing, we will continue next week with our workbook.
I'd like to welcome everyone to the services here at Ephesus this morning. And if, if you're visiting, we have sent a special thanks to you for being here. And if you are a first time visitor, we would ask you to fill out one of the visitors card and you'll find them in a few pew right behind, in front of you and put it in the collection plate as you exit. We meet here at 10 o'clock for classes for all age group. 10 o'clock for all that uh, classes. At 11 o'clock we have communion and preaching. And we also have a Sunday evening service at five and Wednesday night Bible study at seven. So we'd appreciate your attendance at any and all of these that, that you can uh, attend. Let's remember those that are sick and those that uh, uh, are expecting to have surgery and uh, we want to have special prayer for uh, Sister Betty Ham is to have knee surgery, I believe it's this Tuesday at uh, Athens Hospital. And uh, Brother Jimmy Wales is to have a heart ablation, ablation procedure at Friday at Huntsville Hospital. Is there any other sick that needs to be mentioned at this time? On a better note, there will be a kids' Valentine's party this afternoon at 1.30 at the Lanham home. So all those with uh, children, young children, and older children, whatever, if you want to, is invited to this. I have a thank, several thank you cards to read. It says, uh, Thank you, we're so grateful for the outpouring of love and sympathy during this time of grief for our family. We'll always remember your kindness. It says to the Ephesus church family and friends, thank you for the beautiful uh, floral spray that you sent in memory of our mother and grandmother, Alicia Mason. Thanks also to the members who attended the visitation and funerals uh, and our funeral services. Your love and kindness toward our family during this difficult time will never be forgotten. May God bless. It's Keith and Carol Mason, Nesbeth's family, Ryan and Carly. Also, there'll be a gospel meeting at the Pepper Road Church of Christ February the 17th through the 21st. And this will be with uh, Ken McDaniel. So I'll post this on, on the board back there for you to view. Also, there will be a gospel singing at the Jordan Park Church of Christ. This is in Huntsville. This will be Friday at 7 o'clock, February the 16th, Friday at 7 o'clock. That's at Jordan Park Church of Christ. Also, uh, be a gospel meeting uh, at uh, Church of Christ at Oakland with Mr. Jason Shackelford. Be Sunday, February the 18th through Friday, February the 23rd. That's at the uh, Oakland Church of Christ. Is there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? And I'll turn the service to the brother Lamb. Throughout the uh, reading of the Bible, you can come across a section in the Bible called Judges. And if you are new to reading the scripture and following along, Judges is a, uh, a very uh, simple book if you look at the big picture 
of the book of Judges. Because Judges goes through this revolving um, Ferris wheel of a, a cycle of things. There would be peace in the land and everything would be well and they would enjoy that peace. And then that would turn into Israel doing evil in the eyes of God. They would become distracted. They would do things that were wrong. They would go to idols. They would serve other things. They would just simply enjoy the peace and become lazy. And then they would do evil in the eyes of God. Then that would grow and that would turn into God punishing Israel because of the evil that they had done. And God being a righteous God, he then punishes Israel for the evil that they were committing. And then following that punishment, because of course Israel didn't like to be punished, they would cry out to God because of the other nations that were beating down upon them. And, and they would not like that, so they would cry out to God and say, God save us. And then God would, of course, send someone to them and he would raise up a judge. The judge would rule in the land and, and everything would uh, begin to right the ship, so to speak, and things would be going in the right direction and Israel would ultimately be delivered from whatever situation that they had found themselves in and then they would have peace in the land and the cycle would almost always return. Israel would do evil in the eyes of God. God would punish Israel. Israel would cry out for God. God would raise up a judge, and then Israel would be delivered. And so with this going on in Judges, in Judges chapter 2, in verse 14, this is what is said. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the, land, into the hands of plunders who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around them, so they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. When Israel rebelled against God, God would then make these things happen to them that was not very fun for the Israelites. They would do this evil. He would send out enemies before them who, who would cause this great calamity to fall upon them. They would be distressed. <coughs> All of these things would be displeasing to them. But even in this, God would stay close enough to hear their cries. Because in verse 16, it said, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Now, if you think about being an Israelite during that time, and, and you, were, you were there, you experienced this peace and prosperity, and you, and you experienced this good time, and then you realize, hey, look how far away from God we've come, and now we're having all this bad stuff happen because we've left God. And now we're being sold into slavery, and we're having all these devastating things. We're, you know, all this distress that's fallen upon us, this, this weight, this burden, this very wondering, am I going to live? And then only to cry out to God and for Him to bring up a ruler, a judge for the nation to lead you out of that. And so now you're not wondering about what am, if I, or if not, I'm going to live, but rather now you're wondering, you know, what am, I, what am I going to eat? You know, things are so good, everything's just so great. <clears throat> to experience that sort of deliverance was something that those people would remember until basically that generation that experienced the devastation and the prosperity had fallen off and they had all died. Well, when only the ones who had experienced the prosperity had lived, they, well, we can do whatever we want to do. Only to lead them down that circle and that cycle of judges again. Now, I'll tell you all that, and I'm sure you're wondering, well, what, how does this tie in to us remembering Jesus? <coughs> it's very simple. We are to remember our deliverer and our rescuer. In Galatians chapter 1, 
in Galatians chapter 1, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The joy of being rescued from a dire and dangerous situation like the Israelites in the land of just and the, in the time of the judges is nothing compared to the dire and dangerous circumstance that we found ourselves in this destitute state of sin of which we were delivered and we were rescued from ourselves. The sin in which Christ delivered and rescued us from is something that we should remember and that we should rejoice each and every day in this time and in this moment. We remember our deliverer. We remember our rescuer. We remember our redeemer who brought us back from this world and this life of sin that we were in. We're going to sing number 300 and we'll sing just the first and the third verses. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me on the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my perfect lamb of God we read in he Hebrews that the bull of the blood of bulls and goats were not sufficient and you had to send something that was sufficient for us and father we pray at this time that as we partake of this bread that we will think back to the cross and we will think of the body that uh, stood in our place so that we could have hope of heaven we pray that we will do this in a well-pleasing manner in your side and in your son's name we pray amen
Let's again pray. God, our Father, we come to you just so thankful, God, for your love for us that you've shown to us by giving us your Son to come to this life and, yeah, be sinless, and but die on the cross of Calvary to save us from our sins. And Father, at this time, as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection, and as we're about to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood, Lord, we just pray that we'll take our minds back to that cross and remember that sacrifice. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing number 110 in the supplement book. Number 110.
book is not in our books. It's a shield about me. A shield about me. <coughs> After we sing this song, when they jump over, they just sing our prayer.
or 520. We are certainly glad that you have all been given and taken advantage of the opportunity to be with us here at Ephesus, and we are aware that some are having to watch online and unable to be with us, and we're glad that you are able to do that as well. I wanted to make a few announcements before we begin, and wanted to uh, make you known of some things that were going on in and around here. Um, Brother Robert and Sister Diane Fudge are away uh, this morning in Mississippi, he's preaching over there, and next week uh, he'll be gone as well. They'll be in uh, Florida for a uh, funeral, and I'll be gone, and my family will be gone to Sandlin Road. I'll be at Sandlin Road this Sunday through Wednesday next week for a meeting there, uh, looking at the idea of being a quitter isn't always a bad thing, so if you are interested in quitting, uh, you know, that's what we're going to be talking about is how we can go about being a quitter and how that's not a bad thing. Uh, and so that would leave no, neither one of us here uh, Sunday. And so what that affords is the opportunity for Brendan Kirby and Adam Nicholson will be preaching here next Sunday. And uh, I'm sure you are all looking forward to that. We're glad that we have uh, a new person here in the world for the first time. They're here. Uh, Miss Ruby uh, is here, and we're glad that Ryan and Carly are also here and able to be with us, and we are so happy for them and uh, the life that they have together and raising a child. So it's, uh, Ryan, your fun has just begun. <laughs> Two women at the house. Uh, recently, uh, I, w I had gone back and was watching some gun smoke and uh having the same name uh you know I, I sometimes i would get called matt dillon growing up and i always thought that was you know that was real cool because i just needed a, all i needed was a festus i didn't have a festus we had a mule but we didn't have a festus and, uh, i was watching matt dillon and, and he he kind of got himself in a little bit of a situation like uh the heroes of tv shows often do and they were uh they were in trouble and they had gotten, he was tied up, and you think, man, what is going to happen to Matt Dillon? What is going to happen to him? Or and maybe you, you've, seen, you've seen Lawson, he's all about uh, Cordell Walker. Walker get himself in the awfulest mess, buried in a coffin underground, and nobody could come find him. I mean, how is he going to get out of this situation? Or, or maybe whatever the character is that you watch, the show that you watch, and sometimes you watch this show, and you, you're just on the edge of your seat, and you're thinking, well, they're going to die. There's no way for them to get out of this. How are they ever going to get out of this? You know, this is, just see, this is just episode two of season three, and you're wondering, how are they going to get out of this? But if you would ever get out of the, the moment of watching this TV show for a second and realize they got, they got 20 episodes this season. They can't, you know, they can't kill off the main one. In episode two, you know, they, they had them on contract all, the whole time. So how are they going? And they're going to live. And so the question is, you know, really, if we think about it in that way, we go, well, how are they going to get out of it? And we get out of that, well, are they going to get out of it mentality? And we think, well, how are they going to get out of that? Boy, old MacGyver got himself in a mess again. How is he going to use that switchblade knife and that lighter to get out of, of, of an airplane, you know, and somehow parachute down? Nobody knows. We, don't, we know, but we think, you know, in the moment when you're watching that, you think, well, they're going to die. And, and I think sometimes we get caught up so much in the moment of our lives that we think, you know, well, this is the end. This is it. This is the end of it. This is the end of it all. And, and we get caught up in this moment <coughs> in which we reside here on this earth. And we think, well, you know, this is, this is it. This is, the, this is the final countdown of this moment. It's all, it's all over. And Paul tries to address this very idea of thinking in 2 Corinthians chapter. In verse 16, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. 
even though our outward man is perishing. We're, we're going closer. Uh, Brother David Holt says this morning, we're getting closer to the dirt. This outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In our present day in life, all I've ever known is the things that I can see, the things that I can touch, the things that I can hold. Those are the things that that, that have always been something that I have embraced, that I have cherished, and that I, that I have held on to. And what Paul is saying, that stuff that you can see, touch, smell, feel, that stuff is temporary. It, it's what you can't see. It's what you can't touch. It's what you can't taste. It, it's what, those are the things that are eternal. And, and what's happening is your body is perishing. And we are getting closer to the ground than, we, than we ever, we're closer today than we've ever been. And we feel like we're going downhill, and, and, and that's why they call it, you know, when you get to 40, they call it over the hill because everything else from there starts going downhill. And the inward man is being renewed day by day. And we oftentimes, we don't, look, we don't think about that inward man. Because just like when we're watching that TV show, we get caught up in the moment. And we forget that there's something beyond this. This morning, we're going to look at this idea of keeping an eternal perspective on things. And not an idea and a perspective of the things that are here on this earth. The things that, that have that, that both good and bad. There are good things in this earth that help us through things. We talked about that in our Bible class this morning, about how we get tired and how we get where we feel like we need to give up and give out, and things that will pick us up. And we need to hold on and embrace those things that will pick us up to get us to the finish line. But keeping an eternal perspective, no matter what this temporary perspective may see or what we may view, or the way that we may view it. So this is the things that we need to look at and that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds is this eternal perspective. And Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> where we just read, in the verses before that, he says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. He said, man, I've, I've had it all happen to me. Yeah, I get, I get knocked down, but I get back up. I've had the wind knocked out of me, but I breathe again. I, I, I've, been, I've been just betrayed by everybody, but look right here. I'm, I'm, I've got it. I've come back. How was Paul persecuted? How was he struck down? How was he hard pressed? How was he perplexed? And many of us have felt much of the same way. We have different things and, and, and similar things and feelings and emotions that Paul experienced and that Paul <coughs> had to go through. And although it maybe it wasn't as severe as he recounts in chapter 11, where he talks about getting 39 stripes, how he'd been beaten with rods, how he's shipwrecked, spent a day and a night in a deep, how he'd been in different types of journeys and perils and waters of men of Gentiles, of countrymen, of wilderness and sea, uh, with false teachers, how, how he's had weariness and toil, and how he ain't slept, and he's been hungry, he's been thirsty, <coughs> and been cold and naked. And he talks about all those physical things that plague him. And then he talks about the mental stuff. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern 
for all the churches. That's a weight that is that's, that cannot, I don't think it can, not, can be explained. But when you experience it, it's a heavy weight. You know, Paul had been through a lot. And so when he talks about, hey, you know, all this stuff that I've been through, that, that ain't nothing. You know, yeah, I've been hit, but I got back up. I, I've been despised and rejected, but hey, people, other people has brought me in. And, and we think about things that we have had happen to us. And, and while those things that have happened to us not necessarily are a spiritual thing, Yes, if we go back and look at the things which happened to Paul. Some of this was because he was a Christian. Him receiving stripes, him being beaten with rods, uh, him being stoned, and sometimes they say he was stoned and left for dead. The shipwreck thing, I, I don't think it had anything to do with whether he was or was not a Christian. I think that's called living life. And that, that's just something that happened. A day and a night in the deep, wasn't he just happy that he wasn't like everybody else at the bottom of the deep? He had held on to a little piece of wood. I don't know if Rose must have moved over for Paul and let him get up there and he could float. I don't know. And, and, and here he is, he's in perils of robbers. Now that could be people that was uh, afflicting him because he was a Christian, but it could be just because he, he was a candidate on that road. Not everything that has happened to you has happened to you because you're a Christian. But because you are a Christian, you must endure it in a godly way. And the key for Paul as he was talking about this and enduring it in a godly way is the fact that he kept the eternal perspective as the thing that mattered and not the earthly perspective of the temporary things as what matters. And so when he is able to look beyond that which is happening to him in this moment. Because, see, his perspective in all things was not like ours is, oftentimes. Because his perspective and who he was has been changed. He had been transformed to the renewing of his mind. To think about things eternally. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world. Or, as I like to think about it, don't be like everybody else. Don't think about things the way everybody else thinks about them. You've got to transform the way that you think. You've got to take what was the way you were thinking and make it something new that is like Christ, that is like God, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I'm not by any means trying to say, well, you need to have false optimism or fake optimism. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. Some of you are thinking, like, what's false optimism? This guy, he's on the 20th store of a skyscraper. He was cleaning the window, and he fell off, and he fell down, and on the 10th floor, somebody said, how are things going? He said, they're going great so far. And they asked him again on the second floor, how are things going? He said, man, they're going great so far. And they asked him down there on the sidewalk, he didn't have nothing to say. So false optimism is this. Man, it's going to be great. It's going to be fine. It doesn't mean that you don't see what's going to happen. But the thing is, is you're looking beyond that what's going to happen. And you're eternally looking at these things, not the way that the world sees them, but you're transformed the way that you think from that which the world sees things. And you think like God thinks. And you think like Christ thinks. And you think about those things that are eternal that you can't necessarily see, touch, and feel. That's so what we have to do is we have to change that. Because some of us have been practicing for 30, 50, 70 years thinking about these temporary things. And that's all we've ever known. And that's all we've ever been associated with. That's all I've ever known. That's all my mama ever knew. That's all my daddy ever knew. That's all my grandparents ever knew. We've got to change that. We are told to change that. And in Philippians chapter 1, Paul, keep in mind, he is writing this letter to the Philippian brethren. As he says in the beginning of chapter 1, I am in chains. 
verse 7. Inasmuch both in my chains. He is writing this from a prison cell. Okay? Keep that in mind. His temporary setting is not at a nice prison like we have today. I mean, these prisons ain't real fun. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Verse 19. Through, how will it turn out for my deliverance? Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation, and he's not just praying for it, hoping about it. His earnest expectation, he expects it to happen. And hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet I will choose what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful to you. And being confident of this, I, I know I, that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. And Paul says, I am hard pressed between these two choices. You know, on one hand, I, 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 I look around this world and I think, there's a whole lot of work for me to do. And, and the fruit that would come from that labor for the glory of Christ would be so awesome and so great and wonderful. But man, I'm burnt out on that. And, and, and if I depart and I leave this and I don't do that work, I get to go to Christ. You see, Paul's life, Paul's life revolved around Jesus. It was going to be filled with Jesus Christ. That's what his life revolved around. So if he stayed, guess what it was going to be about? Jesus Christ. And going to the lost and preaching and teaching and caring and loving and sharing the good news. You know what was going to happen to him if he left? He was going to be with Jesus Christ. Paul said, basically, my life doesn't change. It just changes locations. Because I am so filled with him here on this earth that I'm going to work for him. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. And if I leave this earth... Well, I'm going to be with him. And I'm going to enjoy it. As long as I'm here, I'm going to work. And I'm going to do his work. But if it so happens to be that I shall leave, I, I depart, then I go home. How can we have that eternal view like Paul? How is it that, that I can look through things through an eternal lens and not that of an earthly lens. Paul begins in verse 19 by talking about his deliverance and asking for their prayer. He asks for them to pray for him. I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. By you praying for me? And that's what I need. I know it's going to all be all right. Why do I know it's going to be all right? Because I've asked you to pray for me. And I know you are. And I know you're going to pray for me, and I'm going to pray for you. And that's not just meant, meant seemingly something that we just say, but we commit ourselves to it like Paul did. And, and if you go through it and read, I'm not going to just say this off the top of my head because I didn't just check it 100%. But almost always, without exception, and he always began by saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in my prayers, I've always prayed for you. 
And I hope that you're praying for me. I have prayed for you a long time. It nearly almost always starts in that some sort of wording. He had committed himself to pray for them, and not only to pray for them, but he asked them for their prayers. Do we take time to love one another enough that we commit ourselves to praying for one another? Do we have the faith and the hope of having this eternal perspective that we ask others to pray for us? And I think sometimes it is this thing of, well, I, you know, I don't want to ask everybody for that. I don't want to burden them with that. I don't want to weigh them down with that. I don't, and then some of it's, you know, well, I don't want everybody knowing my business. And then some of it is a little bit of both those things. And you go, well, then they're going to want to know what happened next. Yeah, I, I feel you. I hate for everybody to love me too and want to care about me and want to know if, they, if I'm okay and how I'm doing. And Now, some people do it to just be nosy to air the laundry out. And I got that, and them people got their own problems. But we can't love you if we don't know about it, and we can't know about it by not asking. But how often do we ask, and then we go, well, you know what, let's pray. Let me pray for you. And when we pray for each other about temporary problems on this earth, we pray to help each other have this eternal mindset like Paul that no matter what the circumstances are we face, that we look beyond this. That we look beyond this idea of right here and right now. And Paul goes, hey, look, I know I'm going to get out of this prison. I don't know if I, when I get out of this prison if I'm going to go with y'all and, and be there in Philippi and encourage you and you encourage me. Or I don't know if I'm going to die in this prison. Uh, but I can tell you one thing. I'm going to get out. That's one guarantee that I got. Now, when am I going to get out? I don't know. But I ain't worried about the when. I'm worried about focusing on what's going to happen when I do. I'm going to be with him or I'm going to be with you. But in either place, I'm going to be with Christ. And that's the eternal view that we've got to have. And we've got to pray for one another that we can have that. In verse 19, he also talks about the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He sought to live only by the power of the Holy Spirit. He, he sought the Holy Spirit in all that he did because he knew that he had submitted himself to Jesus Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but now Christ that lives in me and His Spirit leading me and His Spirit guiding me and His Spirit taking me through this life. You know, the, the things that I used to think about that were all selfish and needful and good for myself, I put those things off that I could live by the Spirit. That's what Paul's saying. This supply, this enrichment, this encouragement, we are not to go on our own flesh or our own power. Rather, by embracing the new life, having this new life of the Spirit to guide and to strengthen us, that we lean not on our own understanding, but on Him. That we ask and we talk and we pray and we converse with God, that we open up the Bible and we read what God would have to say for us to do. And that we put our selfish, worldly cares and needs, that we slowly do away with those where we have less and less and less of them, and we are more and more and more and more filled with the fruits of the Spirit. To help us view things not temporarily, but eternally. And thinking about things eternally is having a heavenly mindset that you're thinking about the hereafter and not like when you go in the kitchen and you can't remember why and you go, well, what am I hereafter? But rather you're thinking about the thing that is beyond this life. As that which is said in Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. To live or not to live. To be or not. And that's exactly what Paul was asking. He said, it doesn't matter whether I am or I am a was. Because I'm filled with Christ. 
And, and I desire what lies ahead even more than I desire what lies right now. And that's a difficult thing to do. Because guess what? we got a lot of people around us that love us. And we love a lot of people that are around us. And when we say, you know, I, I want what, what's out there. I want those heavenly things. I want the heavenly reward. You can't help but think about those that you love. And those that love you and that, that they're going to miss you. But Paul says, well, you need to make your life so filled with Christ that it doesn't matter that there is no change for you. You know, Paul looked at this as departing. And the word departing is something that is not commonly used in our society, our language today. We don't go, whenceforth, where should thou depart? You know, we go, where y'all going? That's what we say. And so this idea of to depart was a thing that they oftentimes used for ships leaving, leaving the bay. They would leave port. That ship has departed. We use it mainly today with aircraft. Their departure time was 0430. And their arrival time was 0630 or whatever. But the whole idea of departing is this idea of they're arriving somewhere else later. And when Paul says to leave here is to depart. And I'm going to arrive with him. And so oftentimes, thinking about this worldly instead of heavenly, we say they left us. They have left me. But Paul says, I'm just departing. I'm going to arrive. And guess what? You can depart too. Most people that I know they desire to be at home. And so the question is, where is home? You know, I just want to be at home. I don't want to go, I don't want to go to the nursing home. Where you want to go? I want to go home. That's where I want to go. I want to stay home. I want to be home as long as I can be home. How many of us really long to go home? That we long to go home with God. And the reason I think some of us myself included. I don't know that I've really done everything that I need to do to ensure that I'm going home. A am I 100% sure that if I departed this earth that home would be with Christ? You know, that, that's, that's what we're oftentimes we're faced with and, and that we pray about and we talk about. And, and, and that's what we're here for is to encourage you, to help you, to embrace you so that you can have that blessed assurance that when you depart from this life that you arrive at home with God. And the way that we can begin by doing that is being like Paul and the fact that I'm committed to earthly service. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 9 and verse 4. We only have a short time to work on earth. And we need to make our life count for Jesus. He says this, The night comes when no man can work. There's going to be a time where it's all going to be done. There could be nothing else for you to do for him on this earth. That nobody, nobody will. So when we commit ourselves to earthly service for His greater good, that eternal perspective is on the forefront of our minds because that's the reason that we're serving. And that we can be part of great service here on this earth with that eternal perspective. So the question is this, how have we engaged ourselves into this work? And don't misunderstand me, I am not by any means 
saying that well, y'all didn't do enough work and service here on this earth, so you can't be sure that you got a home in God. But the only reason you'd be serving here on this earth is because you've been changed and molded into something that he made you. And then you can't help but work. And you can't help but be about his business. Because that's who you are. Because to live is Christ. And that's all you can do. You can't help it. How have we engaged ourselves into this work? You know, we ourselves decide, we got to decide that we're going to be productive for him. We've got to decide that I can't make you. Uh, maybe, maybe I can present opportunities, but I can't force you to do it. I can't make you do something that you don't want to do. It can't be done. All we can do is encourage you, embrace you, hug you, congratulate you when you do it. But I can't force you to do it. And it's so easy to have this earthly view about all, any and all things about I don't know how I can or I don't know uh, I can't serve this way or I can't do this and I can't do that and, and we, we have this idea of we find all these ways that I can't serve and I can't be any count and I can't be good and I can't help out the Lord we think of all the ways that we can't do that we don't think about the things that we can do you see when we find something that we can do we jump into it we have to devote ourselves to finding him first and when we have really found him, the ways that we can serve, the way that we can be committed to earthly service, they will appear abundantly. Well, yeah, I might wish I could have done this over here more. Well, that might be fine. I wish I could go on a mission trip to the Bahamas by myself. <laughs> Whatever. I think you might have some ul ulterior motives there. We need to devote ourselves to Him so much that it inconveniences part of our lives. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we go, well, you know what? I find myself doing all this stuff over here and, you know, I know they're doing that thing down there at the building and I know that, that the, the ladies are getting together and I know they got a men's breakfast thing and I know all that's going on, but I just got so much other stuff that I need to do. Well, see, what's happening is you're finding God an inconvenience. Instead of finding all this other stuff as inconveniences to serve God. And when you begin to have that view, that eternal view, we find ourselves living like Paul and saying the same things. To live is Christ and to die is gain. As he said in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, set your mind on things above and not on things on this earth. We've got to set our mind on these things above. God has commanded that we live with an, excuse me, an eternal perspective. And let me tell you something. He hadn't made any command on anyone that, number one, they weren't able to do. And number two, when you think about the reason that he commanded it, is because the nature of man is to not do it. Our very nature is not to think about things on above, and that's not our nature. Our nature is to think about everything right here in front of us, right here and now, on this earth, and to not worry about that because that stuff above ain't bothering me right now. So being commanded to do this means that we're going to have to change some things and do some things that aren't natural, not necessarily comfortable, and quite honestly, and sometimes, not really fun. If we choose to continually set our mind on things above, as we grow and as we develop a habit of setting our mind on eternal things, we begin to handle things of this worldly inconvenience of being here in this earthbound body we view these things differently because we realize the things that are eternal the things that last forever they can't be seen they can't be touched 
that can't be felt. So when you think about making your life count, a lot of times people think about making their life count by what kind of legacy are they leaving behind? Who are the people going to remember me for, my kids and my family, and, and maybe I can make enough money and give it to the hospital, they can name a building after me down there at the college or whatever. And that's great, and that's wonderful, and I think good things come from those things. But making your life count and leaving your impact, like Paul, we ain't talking about his family. We're not talking about his kids. We're not talking about all this stuff with Paul. Or what are we talking about with Paul? What is the legacy of Paul and his life count? It's the things that he did for Christ, keeping an eternal view. The only thing that will outlive us is the work that we did for Christ. Because that's the only work that is eternal. If you're here this morning and you are unsure that your home is in heaven, we would love to talk with you about it, discuss it about you, and help you embrace and have that blessed assurance that it is. If you're to the Lord's invitation anyway, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Do the sweet voice of Jesus